Dr. Fowl, it's great to have you on our podcast this afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Scott. For those of you that don't know who Dr. Fow is, um, Dr. Wade Fow, PhD, CFA, RICP, is an esteemed expert holding a doctorate from Princeton University with several research articles published in various academic and practitioner journals. His work has garnered attention from prestigious outlets, including The Economist, The New York Times. Dr. Fow is founder of The Retirement Researcher, offering invaluable resources on retirement income planning. Dr. Fow is a sought after speaker, author, um, solidifying his influence in the field of retirement planning. He is the author of several impactful books for retirement planning, like Retirement Planning Guidebook and Safety First Retirement Planning. His research and development has helped produce the great tools like the RISA Retirement Income Style Awareness Assessment, which helps those identify how they want to distribute retirement assets. This is also one of the reasons why we're talking to Wade today. Thank you, Wade. Good to see you. Really excited to have you on our podcast and discuss these things that I think can help several in retirement. Absolutely. Happy to be here and talk about retirement is my favorite topic. <laughs> awesome. So what are some things that some common pitfalls that you see uh, that many retirees make in income planning? And what are some areas where they can avoid those things, the steps they can take? Mm -hmm. Well, that's, I mean, that could be a really broad question that we could talk all, in, all day <laughs> about because there's so many different aspects of retirement with social security and Medicare decisions and long-term care. But maybe just related to your retirement styles, like you mentioned, I think a really important idea, just as people get started with retirement planning, where they might make a mistake is just not having the opportunity to recognize that there are different ways to build retirement strategies. And everyone has different preferences about what's going to work best for them, what's going to resonate best for them. And I worry that with the consumer media, sometimes a message pushes people towards a particular strategy that would be right for some people, but it's not right for everyone. And it's important to just make sure you do have that foundation as a starting point with retirement to build a strategy that you're comfortable with in terms of how it mixes growth and safety opportunities, optionality and commitment and so forth. Yeah. And you recently deployed the RISA, which helps people in really determining how they would like to source their retirement income and assets. And you mentioned that people don't really change the way they want to take income, that it's maybe like innately within them. Um, do you have any idea why that would be? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's really that sort of statement that people's retirement style doesn't change over time. We've got a few different data points that suggest that's true. And why it's true, though, it really is maybe hard to say, but <laughs> it just it seems like people are wired a particular way. Like when you think about markets and, and market growth and market volatility, how comfortable are you relying on the idea that stocks will outperform bonds in your retirement the answer to that, I think it's just a matter of how people are wired. And so it doesn't matter how markets have been doing recently, unlike with risk tolerance questionnaires and that sort of thing, where we do see if markets are doing well, people score as more risk tolerant. <laughs> if markets yeah. are doing poorly, they <laughs> score as more risk averse. But we don't really see that with this more fundamental question about what are your preferences for retirement income? And we've been doing a few national studies at this point to be able to make that determination. So I'm um, a lot of, I don't know how deep in the weeds you'd like to go, but yeah, we, we think we can pretty clearly make this sort of statement confidently that people have a style that will stick with them throughout their lifetime. Well, I think also too, wouldn't you agree that, you know, people's experience with how they think money works from their affects their outlook and how they look at their nest egg. Um, and that maybe has something to do with once they select a channel and how to utilize their retirement nest egg, they just fall in line with that. Um, in my book, Expedition Retirement, I talk about the retirement risk shift and how different it is uh, from when you're working during your working years and how it has to, that risk shift changes into retirement years. So how can retirees navigate some of these complexities with their risk changing as they enter in retirement and uh, towards the end of their lives. Yeah, this is a really important aspect of retirement because in a lot of ways, this idea of retirement income, it's still new and people aren't used to thinking about it. I, I've dated the birth of retirement income planning to an article written in 1991 
Harry Markowitz, who won a Nobel Prize in economics for developing modern portfolio theory about how to build investment portfolios for accumulation, for, for growing that pot of assets for retirement. He never really thought about households. And after thinking about it for an evening, he recognized households face a very different problem. And it's especially true in retirement. Instead of relying on your paycheck from work to cover your spending needs, you have to rely on distributions from your assets. You don't know how long you're going to live, so you don't know how quickly you can spend down those assets so that you don't run out. When, when you're retired and when you're spending from your assets, market volatility has a different impact. If there's a market downturn, when you're saving, that can be helpful because you, your new savings will buy more shares. But when you're retired, that's problematic because you have to sell more shares to meet a spending need. And then there's all these different spending shocks that retirees can face where outside of their budget with long-term care and big healthcare bills and things, they, they require some additional flexibility to meet these types of spending shocks. So risk in retirement really is different. And it, it really becomes important at that point to start understanding and recognizing we have to think about retirement differently we don't necessarily, although some people might be okay ultimately, but for the most part, what we find is two thirds of the population will want to approach retirement differently from the general pre-retirement investment management wealth accumulation approach that is most commonly recognized as available for the pre-retirement world. Right. We, we talk about, we use the analogy of often with clients of climbing Mount Everest and, mm -hmm. you know, you, you have the, the goal of getting to the top, but what about the way back down? And that's where um, from a financial advisor perspective that a risk tolerance to your point is not enough. And so let's talk more about the RISA and how that can help identify and assess uh, that benefit for the client on what route they should adapt to and, and make sure they fall in line with the retirement plan. For those clients that I work with and my new potential clients that I'll be working with in the future, what message do you have for those people entering retirement or in retirement, the importance of a tool like this in establishing a retirement plan that's customized for them and their needs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the RISA, it's really a new development. I So with the research I've done about retirement strategies, I started to see right away that there are these huge disagreements about how to approach retirement. And you have different schools of thought, different approaches. And there was never really any sort of framework to help guide decision making around this. So I, I worked with my colleague, Alex Marguia, who has a PhD in psychology. And so we really brought this mix of, could we understand how, what preferences do people have and how could that translate into a starting point for their retirement strategy? And with that research, we really uncovered these two factors that are key. And so for listeners to start thinking about this for yourself and to take the, the RISA assessment to get that sense of, well, how do you score on these factors? Are you more probability based? Are you comfortable relying on the idea that a diversified portfolio will perform in a manner that will support a, a stronger level of spending in retirement? Or are you safety first? Before you start investing, you really want to have contractual protections in place to help support your basic expenses in retirement. The other factor, if you're optionality oriented, you really value having flexibility for your assets above all else. If you're commitment oriented, you're actually more comfortable committing to something that you know will solve for your lifetime need. And so you don't have to be as worried about that anymore. And, and this will help protect family members in the event of cognitive decline and things like that. And so with these factors, it really, the, this was the fascinating part for me. It explains all the different retirement strategies out there, whether it's a total return investing approach, a bucketing approach where you invest differently based on different spending goals over time, or the uh, income protection approach where you build a floor of reliable protected lifetime income to cover your basics and then start investing or a risk wrap approach, which is more comfort with market investing, but still wanting to put guardrails and protections around that in some sort of manner. And so people can take this assessment and then have the starting point that it's not a guarantee that this is the strategy you're ultimately going to want to use, but it seems like a pretty good indication for the most part of Here's a good starting point for you to consider with building your strategy. And then when you hear different approaches in, in the broader consumer media, you'll have a better sense of, well, are they speaking the same language as me? 
or are they speaking to a different audience than me? Uh, it'll give the people the opportunity to better align strategies and approaches with what truly resonates with them, given that not every person knows that there's this big debate in the retirement world and that there's all these different approaches and that you have choices and options in, and to find the right option for you. I think that's important, having a retirement plan that's customized for you based off of how you see fit, you want to take those income options and growth. Uh, I think that's important. When I you know, meet in the office with potential clients, existing clients, and they've worked with other advisors, I'd say, what, wh- why did you, I would ask them, what do you, why did you pick this particular policy or this particular strategy? And they just say the advisor recommended it. And so to go through this assessment with my existing clients and new clients, it's really impactful because it's going through how they, from their perspective, would like to take certain risks or take risks off the table as they consider their retirement needs. Let's talk about, you mentioned a little bit with the risk of living too long. Uh, of course, there's an income risk there, but there's also a healthcare spending risk. And uh, we know that Medicare has certain gaps and one of that would be, one of those would be long-term care. So what do you see as some viable options for people when considering long-term care needs as they uh, enter in retirement and they know that this is a, a, a significant surprise in retirement that could really increase their expenses. Mm-hmm. Yeah, long-term care is the potentially the biggest spending shock that retirees face. You know, some people will make it through retirement and never pay a cent for long-term care needs. Uh, at the other extreme, in cases of dementia that may go on for 10 years, there could be in excess of a million dollars of long-term care-related expenses. And so it's a struggle for how to build a strategy around that. There's really, at the end of the day, four basic options available. You can try to self-fund, which just means you save enough extra reserve assets before you retire so that you feel comfortable that you can manage a reasonably significant long-term care scenario that if, if you can meet those bills, you'll feel comfortable with retirement. There's Medicaid, not Medicare, as you noted. Medicare does not cover long-term care, but Medicaid is available. If you've depleted your other resources and assets, you may have the opportunity to use Medicaid to help pay long-term care bills. Though that's not a great strategy to use as a starting point, just because of the demographic pressures. Uh, At the end of the day, you might really prefer if you could self-pay for care to get access to better services. And then there's long-term care insurance. There's the traditional policies. You do have to go through an underwriting process to make sure you don't already have a medical condition that makes it more likely to need long-term care. But you have traditional policies that have fallen a bit out of favor just because with surprises about interest rates being so low and with people holding onto these policies more than expected, <laughs> the, the premiums have had to increase to make sure that the coverage could, could remain So we've seen more and more shift to a fourth approach, which is a hybrid type insurance policy that would combine long-term care with either more commonly life insurance, but also sometimes with annuities that are able to bundle this together in a manner that can make it more affordable and also not make it completely uh, a use it or lose it situation where you may pay for long-term care for all these years for, for insurance and then never get any benefit from the policy if it's mixed with life insurance that means there would still be a death benefit available that would help offset if you never needed long-term care. But if you did need it, you have that extra protection to cover those bills for long-term care needs. For long-term care, obviously, it's the key with the long-term care insurance is to get it earlier, right? And most people don't think about those things when they're younger. Um, but these solutions can definitely, based off the client's age, their health, all provide options for them and protecting against those surprises. Part of, you know, the retirement planning aspect is also planning for things like income, which is can be standardized and you have an environmental risk and all these things that that occur with investment risk and and other areas. But when we look at um, long-term care risk, it's kind of a surprise that people don't expect, right? They all know they're going to get older Um, but they all think they're the exception, I think, sometimes to that rule. And the stats show otherwise. And so um, when you look at um, options for protection and providing uh, long-term care needs, how 
like how important do you think it is to address the need as much as you can versus just avoidance and not doing anything at all? <laughs> <laughs> well, avoidance is leading to a default long-term care policy, which <laughs> may be depending <laughs> on unpaid support through children. Or, right. And this, I mean, it's really important to just plan for this and to have conversations with family members because that is the default. Your family is going to take care of you. Uh, that could mean people sacrificing their careers, sacrificing their own retirement abilities and so forth. And yeah, it's very unpleasant to think about needing long-term care because it really means you've, you're dependent on someone else, but your family will surely thank you to, if you did put some effort into making a plan that everyone is comfortable with so that th whether that involves insurance or not, at least having a thoughtful approach for how to receive care, to set up for in-home care, sub paid support services, having a plan so that it's not just completely dumped on the lap of right. other family members to figure out what to do when the, the need arises. Let's look at really economic uh, conditions right now, such as inflation and interest rates. How do you think this is impacting people's income in retirement currently? As I'm in my office meeting with a new potential clients, many of them are pulling their, their assets out of the market and putting them in cash equivalents and money market and CDs because they're concerned and they want to safeguard those things. How do you see what's going on right now with the current economic conditions with retirees? Well, right. I mean, on the inflation side, inflation has been coming back down, which is great, but it, it still creates the problem that if for the last few years, 2021, 2022, especially, we saw inflation rates six, seven, depending on when exactly you measure it, up to as much as 9%. And that's a permanent increase in the price level. So that suddenly, even if inflation comes back under control, you still have these higher prices throughout your retirement that you may not have anticipated in advance. So it, it puts pressure on retirees to fund that additional cost of living from that inflation. Interest rates are tough too, because when interest rates are lower, your assets aren't generating as much cash flows. If you hold fixed income assets, there's just you're getting less interest payments on it. It makes retirement more expensive because you need that much more assets saved to generate the type of interest to pay for your retirement. Uh, this is something that is still surmountable still, and it's kind of counterintuitive, but when we think about tools like annuities and so forth, even though they follow the same trend as bonds that they pay more when interest rates are higher, on a relative basis, the case can be stronger for using that sort of risk pooling insurance in a low interest rate world, because the, the risk pooling aspect becomes all the more important. And people are always worried about markets, but part of being a long-term investor is just staying the course with a strategy and to not abandon. But when I, I think sometimes that whole issue of when people shift into cash because they're concerned about the market, mm -hmm. that may be a case where they didn't adequately get a chance to uncover their retirement style. They may have been pushed into that total return investing strategy for retirement, and it really doesn't resonate with them. And so therefore, they're not really following the idea of <laughs> these strategies that tell you to hold 50 to 75% stocks in retirement. It's tough for some people. They may be much better served by an income protection strategy where they do have reliable income in place to cover their basic expenses. And then they're not as vulnerable to a market downturn because it's not going to impact their ability to meet their basic expenses in retirement. In many cases, that can give people more comfort to actually invest those other funds uh, for the long term and in a manner that so that they're not as worried. They, they can sleep at night. They're not panicked about what are the financial markets going to do tomorrow. And then ultimately, over time, markets do tend to grow. And so they, they have the opportunity to not miss out on that market growth because they stay invested. Absolutely. That's awesome. I think it's a symptom, right, of people making decisions with retirement assets when they're not properly allocated on how they expect to have their nest egg perform. Let's talk more about what we see often, which is I call it talking heads in the media, uh, people painting with a broad brush on what retirees should do. And it's really hard to talk to a major, huge audience uh, in the public and tell them to do certain things when you really don't know their personal situation. So right now, uh, you know, the Roth account. So 
what is the role of, of Roth accounts? And there's several pundits and financial entertainers, as I call them, that talk about the importance of Roth, but Roth isn't always the best strategy for certain people in retirement and dist- distribution of Roth or even in dur- work during working years. So how do you see um, that that option with utilizing things like Roth accounts in retirement and how it can benefit somebody and where it may not be the right situation for others? Well, yeah, I mean, everything else the same. It's great to have money in the Roth account. It it can be tricky to get it there in the first place. But once it's there, (laughs) you have a lot of flexibility because you can take out those distributions once they're qualified, once you're 59 and a half and have had that an account open for at least five years and so forth. But then you have access to spending resources that don't go into your adjusted gross income. So it can be really powerful to help manage all these, not just federal income taxes and state income taxes, but these other odd aspects of the tax code, like how social security benefits are taxed, how Medicare premiums are determined, uh, how your long-term capital gains are taxed when they're uh, tax stacked on top of your ordinary income through retirement, if it's from an IRA instead of a Roth IRA. But the, the issue is getting money into the Roth account. And it's really a matter of assessing Am I, we have to pay taxes at some point, but we want to look for opportunities to pay taxes at the lowest possible rates. So if I'm a high earner today and I'm facing higher tax rates today, I'm probably not going to want to put the money into the Roth today. I might want to get that tax deduction by putting it into a tr- more traditional IRA or 401k plan. But then if I have years where I'm low earnings or I have a large deductible healthcare expense, or perhaps there's been a significant market downturn and I've got some cash on the sidelines that I could pay the taxes with, those could be good opportunities to consider Roth conversions to get money over into this account at a lower overall tax rate to create that flexibility for the future. So that I think this whole idea of tax planning and looking for opportunities to pay those taxes at lower rates And it's all the more important now because after the SECURE Act, uh, adult children who inherit IRA accounts, they now have a 10-year window to take that out. And if they're in their peak earnings years, as a retiree, you want to compare your tax rates to what your beneficiaries' tax rates will be when they're forced to take that money out. I I think there can be a lot of interesting opportunities to look around doing those types of Roth conversions and, and getting that flexibility for those assets. Way, do you think people should consider, you know, the sunsetting potential increase in taxes uh, with the sunsetting of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act as they look at Roth? Or is that not a good idea to take uh, those Roth contributions and, and, and look at, you know, distributing just with the fact that it's likely we don't know for sure that taxes will increase, but with the rampant government spending, and the fact that we have this huge national debt, uh, you could almost presume that that's what will happen in terms of the tax code that will increase. Yeah, and and the default is in 2026, we go back to the old tax rates from 2017, unless further action. Congress could always right. renew the, those tax provisions. But if nothing's done, the tax rates will go up in 2026. And so in the work I do, I just go with the current law, which current law is will have higher tax rates in 2026. So that can create some unique opportunities. We've got two years left with 2024 and 2025, where we face the current tax rates. We have 12% instead of 15%. We have 22% instead of 25%. Uh, We have the larger standard deductions and things. It could create opportunities in in some cases to really be able to take advantage of something before 2026 gets here. But it is, again, a case-by-case situation where you have to really analyze your own own personal financial situation. Absolutely. Uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, the pros and cons to someone that may be conservative in terms of their investment strategy to rolling or transferring certain assets into something like an annuity for growth. Can you share a little bit on why a a potential retiree would want to consider these things and maybe some cons to really um, not doing it, focusing on more market growth aspects? Yeah. So the basic, when I start talking about like how to build a retirement strategy, we could really simplify to three basic options. You could fund your retirement with bonds. 
that's the least efficient, least effective way, right. most costly way to do it. So the, the two alternatives of that, one is you build that diversified investment portfolio with the hope that the stock market will perform better than bonds and support a higher level of spending. Or the other approach is the, the risk pooling insurance-based approach where you use a financial tool like an annuity that may be underlying invested in bonds, but it's able to support a higher level of spending through the, the risk pooling, the, the fact that those who don't end up living as long and don't need as much for their retirements help to subsidize the payments to those who end up living longer and need more to pay for their retirements. Risk pooling through insurance is competitive with the stock market. So anything, I mean, any approach, this is back to the idea of retirement styles. What are you more comfortable with? Right. But that's where for somebody who's very conservative about investing, bonds are the least effective way to support retirement spending goals. And if you don't even have the chance for that market growth through stocks, that really strengthens the case for the protection through the annuity as being a better option than just having everything in bonds. And also with what I was talking about earlier as well, when you have those lifetime income protections in place through the annuity, you now have a floor of income. You don't have to be worried about me meeting your basic expenses, even if there's a market downturn. Uh, research has shown that this gives people the courage to actually invest a little bit more aggressively with their remaining assets. So the annuity supports their spending and gives them the capacity to invest more in stocks as well. Right. That's going to create a better retirement outcome than having everything in, in cash and bonds. Wade, what, why do you think that you mentioned before that majority of Americans today are looking more for a safety first strategy with the advent of the 401k and people retiring without that income floor? You know, why do you think that is why people are focused more on that versus other aspects, other areas that we talk about with clients in the RISA assessment, like probability based approach? Why do you think that safety first really applies to most people and they identify with that type of strategy. Yes. And so we've done national studies now and the most popular retirement style that comes out of that is consistently income protection. Now, total returns comes in second usually, but it's really there's about two thirds of the population that is looking for that sa either safety first or commitment type idea that a purely pre-retirement investment approach doesn't provide. And, and you're right, this is in the face of, well, we social security is a pension, uh, traditional company pensions, the employer took on the risk to provide that defined benefit pension. We made that transition where the traditional company pension turned into a 401k plan where it's an investment account. And people don't have those pensions anymore despite the fact that two thirds of the population would really want something like that as part of their solution. So it's a struggle. You can create your own personal pension using commercial annuity products, but it's still in many cases, 401k plans don't have an option to do that. So then you have to start thinking about, well, do I roll this over somewhere else? Or what do I do with these funds? It's a real problem because a purely investment-based approach isn't satisfying the needs for a large percentage of the population. And, and that's where, again, people may not necessarily recognize what their retirement style is. So they they, they have investment options, but mm -hmm. that's maybe <laughs> rather than moving towards an income protection approach, they just move to all cash. And that's like we were saying, not an efficient way to build a retirement strategy. Yeah, that's, it's very true. And I think um, with all of the media and what's going on right now we with the wars that we have and uh, coming election people are concerned and you know what as they say um you know you can tell who's skinny dipping when the tide rolls out so um <laughs> and and it's it's you, the people make adjustments probably the timing may not be the right thing or the strategy in making those adjustments may not be the right thing let's talk about let's do some myth busting um so let's do a rapid fire myth busting. Let's talk about uh, what we hear right now from the Dave Ramsey's of the world that you can invest in mutual funds, earning 12%, take out 8% and you'll be fine. Uh, you've published articles on this. Um, let's debunk this concept on how uh, it's flawed. Yeah. And so it's theoretically possible, but the odds of his uh, prescription working are much lower than 50% for an individual funding their retirement. 
And, and we've known this since the 1990s. I don't know why Dave Ramsey is so stubborn about <laughs> he doesn't understand that the average market return is different from a portfolio growth rate. So even if you believe stocks average, well, historically stocks average 10%, I'm sorry, 12%, but that's for one year because of volatility, they don't grow over time at 12%. So he's completely off base on just talking about a 12% growth rate for the stock market. Uh, and if you're not 100% stocks in retirement, that doesn't matter. But plus there's market volatility in the key years of your retirement where you need that kind of growth to make the plan work. If markets don't perform at that level, you fall behind in a manner that's going to lead you to run out of money, probably before you pass away or before your life expectancy. So Dave Ramsey's 8% safe withdrawal rate with 100% stock portfolio earning 12% a year. We just, we've known for a very long time that that's nonsense. And I don't understand why he's so stubborn in, in sticking with that on his show. It's back, back to what you talked about with the difference between a household investor and an insti institutional investor um, right. for the modern portfolio theory, right? Yeah, institutional. It's What he's talking about is if I could just put money in the market and leave it alone for 60 years, <laughs> I'll get, yeah. I won't get that 12% growth, but that's more the scenario that he's implicitly assuming, right. but that's not household investing. <laughs> if I'm retiring today... I may not get that growth for those next few years. And those are the key years to determine the success of my retirement plan. That's awesome. Let, what about the Ken Fisher, right? The dangers of annuities, which he publishes and advertises quite a bit. Uh, what are some things that we could debunk in terms of uh, him just focusing on market assets, which you've, you've talked about before? Yeah, so he offers that total return investing approach, but his whole, I hate annuities and so should you, it's just a marketing gimmick. And he admits that. I, I was at a conference where it was with for financial advisors and he freely admitted that he found this cool marketing gimmick. He talks about how he hates annuities and he gets all kinds of media and press coverage and everything else for that. And it helps him build his business. But he doesn't believe that annuities are bad. It's just not within his business model to, to have annuities as part of the solutions. He's focused purely on building investment portfolios. And so he's offering a total return approach, which again, we find resonates with about a third of the population, but not the other two thirds of the population. I always tell people when they say they hate annuities, then then hand me back, give me your social security check because that's <laughs> what you, you're all annuitants, right? Right. right. You're all, we're all benefiting from this strategy of risk pooling, people contributing with their, their working um, income into a, a strategy like that, which is a form of an annuity. Um, mm -hmm. So I uh, wanted to thank you, Dr. Fowl, for coming in on our podcast. We appreciate all the work and research you've done over the years to help those in retirement, and those planning for retirement, to have a retirement that's designed for them. And uh, it's been impactful in our planning with our clients using tools like the RISA. I wanted to ask you, if there's anything else that you see some hot topics right now in the market or environment that uh, people in retirement should watch for so they don't get taken advantage of by a bad actor or someone that's trying to do certain things uh, to, to their retirement assets or, or in terms of planning that may not be right for them. Is there anything that you see that's been going on right now as, as certain trends that people want to stay away from? Well, there's the whole issue of the scammers are getting more and more sophisticated with the technology that they use and so forth. And people do have to be wary. I just saw something about some sort of like a, it was a timeshare, get your, get out of your timeshare type proposal, but then they were just stealing people's financial information that way. When, when people submit their financial information to get a check on their timeshare, they just had their accounts drained. So you do have to be very cautious and careful because financial scammers are getting more and more sophisticated. And even now you, you get these text messages about, hey, what's up? And it, it's a wrong number. But if you reply to them and then they start trying to engage you in conversation and eventually they have you draining your account for a fake cryptocurrency <laughs> uh, system. So you just, you really have to be careful these days with financial predators. Absolutely. Thanks, Dr. Fowl, for joining us. And we look forward to all the fantastic research that's coming down the line from you, you and your team. We appreciate you spending the time with us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on the show. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you.